salutations, one and all, to Redemption Meditations. Yes, that's right. The uh, the podcast has been renamed, uh, just like the uh, the shards of Narsil that became Anduril, the Flame of the West. The broken pieces of reformed me- reformed meditations have been reforged into a newer and and greater uh, weapon. Uh, I am joined uh, happily by uh, by my, my fellow two of my fellow elders at uh, Redemption Bible Church on this new podcast ministry of Redemption Bible Church. Uh, Elder Steve Crum, how are you? Hi, Lee. And okay. how are you? Oh, I'm fantastic. And then Elder and Pastor Dana, how are you this evening? I'm good. I'm good, Lee. Uh, you're. Your introduction reminded me of um, the song, Feels Like I'm Walking on Broken Glass. I'm not sure why. <laughs> that's how I feel every time I edit anything that has my voice in it. So it that's fitting. <laughs> True story. I was with my boys in an IHOP one time, and a waitress dropped a glass and it shattered, and that song was playing. <laughs> it, was a great, it was a great ironic moment and a, teach, a teaching moment for me and my children. Perfect timing. It was. Yeah. Hopefully you were walking on broken glass with shoes on. We were sitting comfortably in the booth. Good. Good. The way you should. Yeah. <laughs> and keep it out of the pancakes. That's right. So a big goal of this uh of this new show is uh is to tackle uh some some varying topics from time to time, um, perennial and especially timely as they come maybe tackle specific texts somewhere along the way, uh, but to to offer um, some good, solid uh, encouragement, instruction, um, exhortation to not only uh, uh, the members of, of, of our congregation, but also uh, any any listeners out there uh, who, who catch this along the uh, the highways and byways of the World Wide Web. This is so going to be on the web? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. uh, the world, the worldwide one. Believe it or not, the new interwebs. Yeah, the new that yeah. newfangled interwebs that that Al Gore came up with. So nice, man. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> so, of all places, uh, for our first episode, it it, it seemed uh, entirely fitting that we should uh, have our first episode be about uh, what is the gospel. So, I guess I would put that question to to you both what is the gospel is it a message is it a a person is it a a lifestyle well it by definition the gospel like it is the message to be proclaimed it has to be a message to be proclaimed um so i mean that's what the very definition of of someone who brings the good news right it's it's a it's a message and so I think one of the easiest places to see a um, kind of a summary of the gospel is in the opening of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul writes in verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, and that is this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he goes on to say that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter and several others, uh, giving proof, um, essentially, that he did, in fact, rise from the dead. So there's a, the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and raised again on the third day. Yeah, I think one of the things that's helpful when we're trying to narrow down on something and define something is to exclude the stuff that it isn't, right? So there's lots of good things that we can do. We can work at a a food pantry, we can give clothes to people, we can do all sorts of good works, but that's not the gospel. And and it's gotta be, it is good news, like literally, <laughs> that's what it means. And news inherently means words. So the idea that, you know, be, be, be saying constantly preach the gospel and when necessary use words is built on shifting sand. It, you, you, you always need words to, uh, proclaim the gospel. We don't, nobody's going to say, I saw you handing out those cans of food 
and my heart was pierced to its core, you know, that that's not, you can have lots of people who know nothing of the gospel do some of those good works. So it's got to be news. It's got to be the specific news that Paul really hits the bullseye on there in 1 Corinthians 15. It's got to address an exchange. And it's got to address an exchange of our guilt, our sin, our shame placed on Christ's account, his righteousness placed on our account. We don't have to get super technical with that, but if we don't at least start to bump into those things, we're probably not talking about the gospel anymore. Yeah, I think I think Lee, you said that um, like is it a is it a message? And I think both of us have said yes, it's a message uh, to be proclaimed. And and then you also you know is it a is it a, a lifestyle or a person? And I think um, at its core, it's a message. And the answer to is it a person? The, the best answer, really, the only close answer that you can give is well, yes, Jesus, <laughs> right? I mean, Jesus is the embodiment of the gospel, but it really is not to to just say Jesus isn't isn't enough right you have to say he 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 um died for our sins was buried and was resurrected for our sins um and and there in in first Corinthians 15 you know Paul appeals to the authority of scripture right according to the scriptures so all through the scriptures is this um right from Genesis chapter 3 is the promise of a the the uh, the promise uh, that he would send a son who would crush the head of the serpent right um who, who would be a better son uh, than uh Cain who had who had killed Abel um you know not a good send... son i will go on the record and just say <laughs> not a good son <laughs> older sons are often like that i've heard that but not experienced <laughs> it myself <laughs> uh yeah, so the promise of the uh, somebody said that uh, I don't remember who it was that there's a, a scarlet thread of redemption all through the Bible, right? So that whole idea of redemption, um, of Christ saving us from our sins, um, saving us from the penalty of our sins, saving us from the wrath of God, saving us from the sins themselves, right? Saving us from the from the being entrapped and slaves to sin. Um, that's all through the Bible. It's a message that's all through. It's culminated in the person. Of Jesus Christ, and so when you ask, like, is it a lifestyle? N not in the sense of like you can go be the gospel. Mm -hmm. you, you can't be the gospel. It's a message to be proclaimed. But you can be like Christ. We're all going to be that way. Um, even the best Christian is going to be that way very imperfectly. But we are called to be like Him. Um, we're called to be holy as He is holy. We're called to. Um, proclaim the message, be obedient to him, you know, the Great Commission, go and make disciples. Um, all of those things are entailed in that, that lifestyle, like a gospel, I, I don't, you, you almost, I almost, I almost don't want to use the phrase gospel-driven lifestyle, but it's a gospel, mm -hmm. um, in, uh, I don't, it's a gospel-infused lifestyle, I don't know what the right word is for it, it. it's, all, it's all just kind of the life of of sanctification being more yeah, and more conformed right. to the image of christ so right. it, it i like i that's why i kind of said lifestyle with the uh the uh um ironic tone with which i said it <laughs> i tried to say it in italics i don't know if that came through well <laughs> but i well, i think of I think of people like Go Todd ahead. White with his movement, uh, lifestyle Christianity is what it's called. And that, and that is a complete thing that I want to push against. Like it is not a, it's not a lifestyle. It, 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 Christ is your life. Um, right. There is no life uh, without Christ. Um, it's not simply a style of living. It is living. So even just the word itself, I, I have an issue with, um, but the goal of the, the, the Christian life is to be more and more conformed to the image of Christ, being sanctified um, continually, progressively through your life as we uh, partake in the ordinary means of grace together, God growing us the way that he promised to. Um, and that's all fueled by the gospel. Um, and I was glad you, you mentioned sin because the thing I was going to say was um, to have good news, we have to preface it with bad news. Uh, a lot of times our culture yeah. wants to give the gospel, um, even even within the visible church, they want to give the gospel 
good news on top of you already being a good person? <laughs> How can that be good news if you're already doing okay? And we we actually have to we have to preface with the bad news that that you are very bad. Um, it's not just John Piper who's bad, as as we heard in that song. We're we're all bad. Uh, and and we start we start there and and we see the the beauty and glory of Christ uh, uh, shining against and into the darkness that that we are and that we represent. Yeah, yes. I think uh, if you're going to tell the good news, that's going to involve telling people about a savior and his rescue mission, right? But being saved from something requires peril. I think you you mm-hmm. start out with peril. And so you're it's it's a it's the news that the light is overcoming the darkness. Well, if it's not very dark to begin with, then the light doesn't seem very impressive, right? If you're not in a lot of trouble, then someone coming to rescue you isn't significant news. So right. part of t- sharing the gospel and giving people hope is they're going to have to understand how much saving they need. Mm-hmm. And that's hard to tell to people. And a lot of people just kind of skip that part. <laughs> yeah. We don't like to talk about sin. That's for uh, mature time, Christians. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> one, one time, uh, one time, uh, several years ago, there was a lady that um, is still, she's a member of our church. And uh, she had said that her daughter had told her that she, um, uh, did not want to come because she didn't want to be told that she was bad, like that she had sinned. And, uh, you know, or daughter-in-law, I guess it was, but at, at any rate, like that, none of us want to be told, told that we're bad. Right. I mean, we really want to be affirmed that. and that's the whole, that's our whole culture right now is affirmation. And, and, um, and, and yet, uh, Jesus or Paul says in Romans, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Like no matter, no matter that's our, that's our current state. It's, it's unkind to say, you know, you're, you're, you're okay. You're good. You're, we like you, you know, it's unkind mm-hmm. to say, um, you know, you're, you're, you're okay. You're a good person. If they're, if they're dying, <laughs> right. If they're if they're lost in their in their trespasses, it's unkind to say those things. Um, that yeah. reminds me as well. I, I had a friend in college who was who was a new Christian at, at that time, and uh, and she asked me. She's like, "Can you can you help me with some Bible verses that I can send to my friend to say that that she's okay just the way she is?" <laughs> and uh, I said, "I can't think of a single one. <laughs> That's not what the Bible says." <laughs> <laughs> and uh and i and i use that very verse like we've all all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god um and and our only hope is is to be redeemed by christ uh, from our sin mm. um if and if I only if only i'd had the the uh rc sproul uh cosmic trader phrase i would have deployed it because <laughs> like the the cosmic traders have to be pardoned and that's a costly pardon what is wrong with you people? Yeah. <laughs> Gonna work that into every gospel presentation. <laughs> What's yeah, wrong with you people? You <laughs> gotta get the facial expressions down though, too. I mean, he yeah. really yeah, he, he was yeah. he was mad. <laughs> yeah, he was feeling it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know why we're laughing. He's talking about us. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I want to circle back to something that you said, Dana, a couple minutes ago about the um, uh, gospel-centered, um, uh, gospel-driven yeah. label. Um, so I, you know, full transparency, I came up in the in the New Calvinism movement uh, during the heady days of the Obama administration, and. Uh, huh. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> and that and that was the thing, like gospel centered, gospel driven. Like we, you know, we had the gospel coalition. Um and and um should we should we continue using that label? Is that is that label helpful anymore? Or or do we need to come up with a new a new way to describe what we mean uh, when we said when we used to say uh, gospel centered, gospel driven? 
Well, I think, so that's why I was kind of hesitant to use it because it does become sort of a cliche, right? Uh, throughout that, that same movement, I mean, I was reading all those same books and, and it was the gospel according to this and the gospel according to, I had a book one time called the gospel according to the Simpsons. You know, like I don't, <laughs> don't. I, um, I, I, I don't think I still have that book. It's not in my <laughs> sermon prep pile. Um, but, but like anything else, um, the word gospel is a good word, <laughs> right? Like it's, it is, well, literally it's a good word. It means good news. <laughs> literally. It's, it's a good it, it is good for us to be centered on the good news of Jesus Christ, right? To be, to have that be the core message. So, so every, um, every sermon that I preach, I want to have the gospel in it, right? In, in some way or another, the, it has to come back to Jesus. Um, we want people to believe the gospels. So we have to explain what the gospel is, uh, like we were just doing. And so to be gospel centered from a, just a strict standpoint, like it's not a bad label, um, the sort of over the years, over the what millennia, um, various groups of Christians have sort of ruined some of the words that are just normal Christian, like even the word Christian, mm -hmm. um, or evangelical. Or, yeah, or evangelical or fundamental or um, uh, even the word Catholic. Like when we say we're like in the creed that we're a part of the Holy Catholic Church, we have to explain, which I, I really wish the reformers had hung on to that word Me and too. not the Catholic. It just means universal. But it, so some I'm on a crusade to reclaim this word. <laughs> no, no, no crusades, Lee. Those are bad. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, we're going to get canceled already. We've only just begun. But, but, uh, yeah, I think it is appropriate to, to hold on to something that says, he, here's what we're focused on. Here's what our whole life is wrapped up in. Um, you know, here's what our whole ministry is wrapped up in. Uh, um, one of the reasons why one of our, our, our symbol as a church, when we moved our church building a year ago and changed the name and put new signage out and all of that stuff, we adopted the Cairo symbol. Um, part of the reason for that is because it was, um, I want people to drive by, and there are Christians that drive by and go, what is that? I've seen it before, but what is it? And of course, it, it's the it's the Greek letters, the first two letters of Jesus' name, Christ, and um uh, and I want people to like say, what is that? Well, we are we are focused on Christ. Like that's that's our whole identity. I want that to be like a like every church has a cross. The cross is, um, a, you know, a universal symbol of Christianity mm -hmm. that also means nothing to a whole bunch of people, right? It also is just a piece of jewelry or or just a, you know, just just a thing. It doesn't really even mean anything to most people. But so that is a thing that's kind of been water, a symbol that's been watered down, but it still means something incredible, right? We still mm -hmm. preach the cross and we still have, like in our church, we have a cross behind the pulpit or kind of over the pulpit. And um, because I want that to be the focal point that people are looking to the cross, they're looking to Christ on the cross, right? Or no longer on the cross, I guess. Um, yeah, that's like, a key difference. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes, risen we don't, we don't have a crucifix. <laughs> he is yeah. off the cross and risen. The cross is empty as the tomb. Uh, but I, so I, I don't, I don't know of any other like if we adopt some other um, term to say I am, we are this. Mm -hmm. uh, it eventually is going to get watered down too. We just need to hold on to who, who are we? We're Christians. You know, we have we have trusted in Christ and we are to proclaim the gospel um, uh, and we are to do that by using words. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, so our ministries are going to be centered on the gospel. Um, yeah, I don't I don't. Yeah, so I don't St. Francis of Assisi takes an L on that whole. He really using does. Using words thing. He really does. If he, he didn't even say it. Come on. <laughs> He knows better than that. <laughs> you would think.
I thought, I thought he preached he the gospel not. to like birds and stuff. You got to use words <laughs> there too. <laughs> he just was kind to them. every creature. That's what Jerome All creatures said. are God and King. Yeah. Um. So I, I, we'll, we can take a, a hard turn here. So you know, talk, we're talking about hope, uh, the forgiveness of sins, um, the resurre- resurrection of the body, the life everlasting, uh, to go a, a, in a creedal direction. So, uh, having talked as we talked about the gospel, um, what happens after we die? What is the? How does the gospel affect um, how we view the end of life? Uh, since living in Christ is our life and to die is gain. How do we, how do we view death? Who are you directing the question to? Either or. I think it's Steve's turn. I talk too much. It's all Steve. Well, what I like to do is, uh, is uh, eliminate the stuff that's wrong. Right. So what does not happen is we don't go to purgatory, right? We don't go to some place where we're going to sort of work the debt off our account until we can finally work that thing down enough to really like get get through the gates you know to get home (laughs) there's nothing there's nothing in scripture that would support that that's not uh that's that's false so there's nothing there it's very it's pretty explicit that it is appointed upon man to uh die once and then face the judgment it's a very binary either or that is it and after death there's no one last chance to repent and believe. So that's why we we proclaim the gospel with urgency and we send people and we spend money and we we put resources towards telling people about the gospel on this side of the grave. Because once you pass into eternity, your eternity is set one way or the other. Mm. So uh yeah. so so when your your believing loved ones die. Uh, heaven gains another angel. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> That's a, I definitely not what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, we've talked to, we talked about this. Uh, that that is uh, something that somebody may say in a lot of pain. And we've talked about the fact that at the funeral might not be the time to correct that theological error. But that is a theological error. And give so him a hug there, we'll talk later right right there, there's there's some <laughs> there's some discipleship that's required maybe not during the funeral service but since we're not at a funeral service uh, <laughs> angels and humans are not the same things and so we're not crossing over into becoming a, some other creature they're distinct from us so uh, we, we we may be in heaven but we're not in heaven as angels Yeah, so I think uh, the whole uh, distinct creature thing. So um, humans are distinctly made in the image of God. No other creature, no other thing in creation is made in the image of God. So angels are not made in the not made in the image of God. And Hebrews uh, makes this very very clear. The first couple chapters, uh, the first whole chapter into the second chapter, are all about how um uh christ is greater than the angels that you know to which of the angels did i ever say so so christ is greater than the angels and and uh but not only that um humans are greater than angels and uh um i think that's an important point because we have this our for some reason our a a lot of our um, i guess it would be our theology or our 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 angelology is is simply um driven by hollywood or pop culture in some way and that's where a lot of this comes from we don't even know that right mm-hmm. we see it in a movie like we just kind of think oh yeah I, this is what happens and I, we've had people say to church before you know like oh you know heaven gained another angel or whatever no, no that would be a stoop down angels long yeah. to understand salvation there's a unique relationship between the saints and the savior that angels see they stand on the outside looking in and they wish they could understand Mm -hmm. and take part in that like they they long to understand that the scriptures tell us and and um so to say that a person becomes an angel first of all it's just plain wrong but Mm -hmm. but second of all it's actually a um 
uh, like it's uh, it's actually an insult to the person who died, right? Yeah. Um, they're, they're, if they're taking a demotion, a, yeah, right? It's a demotion. Yeah. If they're actually a believer and they've gone to glory, um, they have something that angels never can have. Mm-hmm. Which, which is the the glory um it, it it's even hearing you know well done good and faithful so it's all of that relationship and reward of um eternal life um redemption angels don't have a possibility of redemption they don't have a possibility of that kind of relationship right. with god with christ um so so angels are pretty incredible but we're better. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But Paul even says in First Corinthians that don't you know that you'll judge angels? So yeah. So people will sit in judgment uh, on against the fallen angels. Uh, so um, yeah, it would it would absolutely be a demotion uh, for for a believer in glory to become an angel. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a much greater promise for people than just that. Um, right. Even though we they seem very mysterious and we don't understand them, but but they at the end of the day they're ministering spirits on our on our behalf, uh, serving serving God's people and attending His throne in worship, um, yeah, <clears throat> which we'll get to join in on uh, in glory. So every sin, oh, ah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> every Maybe sin, should, every Lord's day, <laughs> every Lord's day. Man, that yeah. should be a whole episode in and of itself. I love that topic. Um, that that whole that whole thing there. Um, I, I want to go back to something Steve said earlier about uh, kind of the imminency of of gospel presentation because we don't believe in purgatory. You know, we have to reach people with the gospel now um, because because you know once you flee this mortal coil, it's it's one place or the other, and no no switching between the two. Um, there's there's no place to to work it off. Um, you either repent in this life or uh, or this is your best life now, which is a which is a curse, not a not a blessing. Some bad news. Yeah, that's bad news. Yeah, yeah. So so don't buy that book. Um, yeah. And so yeah, so uh, you know, I uh, for people for people like us, we we have a, a certain urgency to 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 preach the gospel um, uh, to to people uh, to fulfill the great commission uh, to take to do our part uh, in the great commission because. Um, we have hope. Uh, we have hope for eternity, and and we we need to reach people with the with that message of of reconciliation with their Creator, um, the the promise of of eternity, worshiping Him uh, that can begin right now, um, and that's uh, again that's a that is our life. Uh, <laughs> if you boil it down, uh, to continue to to glorify God, magnify Him, and and to be uh, to be changed to be to be made more like him um so any uh any any last thoughts on on this topic before we uh move well i think it's important in in the discussion uh that and i don't know that we really talked about it much now and we probably don't need to go too far down this road but as you're as we're talking about the gospel as we're talking about hope um the other, not only do we as sort of modern Christians or American Christians, or whatever, not, not only do we not talk about sin that much, we don't talk about hell hardly at all. And, and it's important to understand for, for people to understand that um, the, the God's judgment and his wrath being poured out on sinners is, is real. Um, and that, that hell um, is real, right? That, um, in an eco- eternal that, conscious he, torment, right? Fashion. Eternal conscious torment, like that. That is real. That it was uh, the Book of Revelation tells us that it was created. The Lake of Fire was created for the devil and his angels, right? So, so for those who rebelled, and um, uh, it it is a real place. It is a real destiny uh, for those who refuse to um, believe to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, I think, I think that, uh, you know, if, when you're sharing the gospel, you don't have to get through every point of, of theology, but it, it's important for people to understand that it's actually real. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that that's, yeah. That's one of the things that you are saved from is that eternal destiny of hell. It's not just like people have this 
image of hell. It's a it's a uh, a Hollywood or a pop culture image of you know Highway to Hell, whatever. It's a pop culture image of hell where you're gonna go and be with your friends. And it's just gonna be you know ah oh, we're just gonna you know party whatever, right? And it's not gonna be that at all. It's gonna be as awful as you know gnashing of teeth. You know it's gonna be awful and. Um, when we're sharing the gospel, like the, the reality of hell needs to be on our mind as we're sharing it with unbelievers. Yeah, the, the biblical picture of this is a lake of fire. Yeah, so You're not going to have a party with your bros in the middle of a <laughs> lake of fire. But a pontoon yeah. boat. Yeah, that's not, that's not what it's going to be. <laughs> right. I'm laughing about it, but it's not a laughing matter. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's, there's so much gravitas behind that call to repent and believe, um, yeah. you know, to, to flee the wrath to come, uh, as, uh, as John the Baptist said. Um, yeah. And not, and so yeah, not was, only to, to so. flee, he, he, now that was a guy right there. <laughs> really makes me hungry for some uh for some locusts hey man it's in your future it's my favorite yeah, dinner bug eater <laughs> yeah <laughs> you you may eat them and not even know you're eating them the, the first bug eater <laughs> <laughs> so and and so i guess one one last thing i want to uh, i wanted to say too is you know uh so the gospel is is a call to uh, to sinners you know to repent and believe um, flee from your sin, run to Christ, um, call, call on Christ to, to forgive you your sins, to cleanse you from your unrighteousness, uh, and then to, to, uh, love your God and enjoy him forever, uh, glorify your God. Um, and that's, that, that's still a continual message, even for believers as well. Uh, you never outgrow the gospel. Uh, we continually are building on it. And so we have to lay the foundation of the gospel and and continue uh, ensuring that that's the foundation. Um, so so we need and we're a forgetful people. Uh, so we need to be reminded of that that basic, and I mean that in in the sense of of a foundational message uh, that we that then we we have to have that foundation to build on top of that uh, with more sound teaching to uh, to feed the people of of God uh, and, uh, and aid them as, as I've, however we can in their, in their sanctification. Yep. So you don't outgrow the gospel. Uh, cause there's, there are, there are the some, gospel. there are some churches that are like, well, once you believe you're in the army now and, uh, you got to go and like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. We're, we're the church militant. Yes. But, but the army still got to eat. Yeah. I, I think the gospel is not just for like those who are about to be saved. Um, you know, we, I need the gospel every week, right? More than that. But like every Lord's day, when we gather together, um, like the three of us, right? We're some of the elders in our church. We all need to hear, need to be reminded, uh, the prayers, like our prayer needs to be gospel centered, right? We need mm -hmm. to be reminded that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We may need to be reminded of the forgiveness of our sins because, because, we, we've been given, we could talk about the law, but we've been given certain laws, right, that we are to do, right? We're to go and be like Christ, uh, be holy as he is. Those are laws. We're, we're given laws to do, um, even as Christians, and we will fail to do them. We, we fail regularly to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. That's the, the summary of all of the law. We break it regular, but like before we get home on a Sunday afternoon, maybe before we leave the parking lot. And... <laughs> Um, we, we break that law. We need to be reminded that even though, uh, you know, I may have gotten mad at Lee and, and broken the law, um, <laughs> even though um, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And the reason for that is because of the gospel. And that should transform my heart every week. Every time I hear that, every time I'm reminded of that, that should push me to praise God from whom all blessings flow. That should just push me to worship, which then should push me to obedience and push me to sharing the gospel. And, and it becomes that lifestyle. Um, yeah. Lifestyle of the redeemed and regenerate. Yeah. 
<laughs> I like it. All right, so we uh, we want to institute a, uh, a a long standing segment at the end of each episode. Uh, still, uh, title to be determined. I kind of like the idea of the library stairs, but just a little. What what have you been reading lately? How about the library ladder? Lee has a Lee has a library ladder. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I have a library ladder. He, he lives in a, such a large. I think it's your bedroom, right? That thing is impressive. Yes. The, this bookcase. couch is where I sleep every night. <laughs> I, have, I have library envy looking at all those books behind you. So the oh, yeah. library, at least library ladder. And, and I sometimes even coordinate them by color, as you see. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> so uh, uh, let's start with Dana. Dana, what have you been reading lately? So I just finished the book, The Unseen Realm by Michael Ooh. Heiser. Um, and it's called, so the subtitle is Recovering the Supernatural Worldview of the Bible. It's really interesting, and I don't agree with a whole bunch of it, um, but there's some really interesting and eye-opening things in it. So uh, I, uh, I'm i not one of those people that um, if they're, you know, if I disagree with an author on one page, I can't recommend the book. There, there's a <laughs> lot of that are like that. I'm not like that. I actually um like i disagree with some of his fundamental hermeneutics how, how he kind of pulls stuff out of scripture but there is some there is a lot of truth in what he's saying about um the the supernatural world so uh whether that's um demons angels spirits the spirit world how that affects uh, spiritual warfare um you know using it like the book of ephesians paul talks about it a lot principalities and powers and those types of things and um so it's been kind of on my mind a lot uh, over the last couple of months as i've been working through the book and uh, i've got a couple other books kind of in related that i've been reading about nice the unseen nice. realm by michael heiser nice steve how about you well we did not actually coordinate this even though some people may think <laughs> that we did i've been reading huh. unseen realities Oh. By some guy named R.C. Sproul. Yeah. And it's it's really good. Sure. It's, he actually, yeah, there you go. So it, he, he actually talks a lot about some of the stuff we've talked about uh, today with heaven and hell. And he's going to, I haven't finished it yet, but uh, ain't the reality of angels and fallen angels and some of those things. So it's uh, it's been great. It's not a, you know, monstrous, you know, thousand page marathon or anything. So I would definitely recommend it. It's been really good. Nice. That one nice. is probably, if I could throw a plug in for Steve's book, that one's probably uh, like I would. I agree with more that RC says. Part of that is just because it's RC and it's hard to argue with. I mean, he's yeah. a genius. He's pretty I solid. Mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and I heard he's a Baptist now, but um, <laughs> it's hard to argue with him. Um, and he, yeah, so, so that one is like from a theological standpoint, he's probably more solid than more, at least in line with what I believe than Michael mm -hmm. Heiser. Um, yeah, he Heiser yeah. wasn't reformed in any way, shape or form. No, he didn't like reformed theology. Yeah. He, he yeah. passed away just a few months ago. Yeah. yeah I, haven't, I haven't finished it yet, but so far, I mean, it's, it would be a great one to give to anybody, you know? Yeah. It's a good. I've read uh, it as, yeah. as well, and build I agree. a foundation for people. Yeah. Yep. yep. And it's small. It's short. So yeah, it's an easy yeah, read. That, that an always easy helps. Yeah, and, is a lot more detailed, and he goes kind of off on some tangents that that scroll does not. Yeah. It is an easy read. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you something completely different. So I, uh, here's a couple books that have that I've been going through lately. Um, the Mystery of Christ, uh, by. Uh, by Samwise Gamgee Renahan uh, is is a a book I've already read, but I'm dipping back into it um, for some particular studies in in Baptist covenant theology. Uh, it's probably the best and most um, most readable, most easy to digest tome on on Baptist covenant theology that I've uh, come across. So I, I highly recommend uh, the Mystery of Christ by by Samuel Renahan. And then uh, another one that's fun, a uh, little a little book of poems by none other than uh, William Cooper, and uh, my my library's hurting you me. You are here, but... fading in the video. Yeah. I don't. 
the people on audio won't be able to see this, but <laughs> yeah. Lee is fading into the ether. There's I am. something weird about that library. I'm starting uh, to suspect. Something's not right. The, the cosmos <laughs> is haunted, as is this library. It looks like <laughs> it, yeah. So Lee I, I could... is a hologram, ladies and gentlemen. He does not really exist. Just, just me and Tupac. That's what we have in common. We're both holograms. <laughs> Going on tour together. That's there right. you go. So yeah. uh, I, I picked. I actually picked up this book. It's the Selected Poems of William Cooper. Um, there's a few. Uh, actually, four of them are from the Olney hymns um, that he that he co-wrote. Um, and uh, and there's a there's a, there's a poem in here uh, for all the. Uh, Monty Python fans out there, a poem called The Shrubbery uh, that is especially interesting. <laughs> uh, those are dangerous. <laughs> those are so dangerous. It's actually kind of funny because he takes all the imagery that nature poets usually use to talk about how beautiful a place is. And you know, because of his melancholy demeanor and uh, struggles with mental health, he actually – the poem is about how these uh, these sights and sounds of nature uh, only uh, remind him of his woe. So it's, <laughs> it's. I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. It's a very he's, playful. He's very goth. <laughs> it, it's it's. I'm never. I'm not very completionist about about reading poetry books. So I'll, I'll just dip in every once in a while, read a poem or two, and move on. But um, but this this is good. So I got it at a half price books. But um, I'm always ready to recommend good poetry to people. So um, yeah. So Look, William Cooper was. Um, uh, John Newton was his pastor. So when you say he co he co wrote the only hymns, that was with John Newton, right? Yep. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I think we know him for the uh, um, isn't it? God moves in a mysterious way. I think that's his famous hymn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the only one I can think of. It's and that that's a great poem in and of itself, and then it's it's paired up with a great tune. Um, so that's how that's how good hymns happen. So. It is. Well, thank you, gentlemen. This has been a, a, a scintillating uh, conversation. Uh, very excited uh, by God's providence to do many more in the future. Um, but yeah. thank you for your time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So the Lord bless you fun. and keep you. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Good note. No, bless us, please. <laughs> bless away. The Lord bless it's you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.